let's see what today's got in store. I was supposed to stream yesterday, but turns out multi-threading programs takes a lot more work than I thought. So that assignment ended up taking pretty much the entirety of morning yesterday. And by the time I finished, I was just drained. So no, no more energy for a leak code. But let's see what today's got. Hopefully it's nothing too difficult. Hopefully no DP. Oddly enough, we haven't really seen a lot of dynamic programming as of yet, which is kind of surprising. I think I've only seen a few pro uh, problems, even in the months that I've been doing this. Just adjust the power settings on this laptop. There we go. Don't want to kill the battery. Hello to Ching, welcome. Made it just in time for when we're starting. A N Rooks. Okay. N Rooks, funny story about this problem, right? My very first internship, uh, I got asked N Queens as my second question. Had absolutely no idea how to do it. Very obviously, right? But N Rooks. N Rooks is a very interesting question because it's got a very simple mathematical solution to it. You can overthink it. But the real solution here, right? What we do is we do int total equals one uh, while N is greater than zero. We do a couple things. We do total multiplies equals by n, and we do n minus equals one. We return total, and that should just be n rooks. The thing about n rooks is it's a very interesting problem to visualize, and if we have time at the end, I'll actually pull up like an MS Paint window and give a sort of visual explanation of this problem. But the solution to n rooks actually just ends up being n factorial. And after figuring that out, it was it was kind of mind blowing. The fact that going from n rooks to queens is like going from easy to like probably one of the more notoriously difficult uh, recursive backtracking problems. Hey man, good to see you. Hop on in, solve some problems with us. They seem to be quite easy today. Okay, ASCII string to integer. You are given a string as containing digits from zero to nine and lowercase alphabet characters. Return the sum of the numbers found in S. Still nothing, dude. Still nothing. Um, the person that gave me my referral, it's one of our recent graduates from our university, they told me that uh, they got a notification pretty much that Google finished their decision process on like hire versus non-hire, which I assume means that they finished the decision of like who they want to move forward in team matching. So still, I guess I have to wait and then if they just decide to not team match me, I guess that's that. But currently, I still have absolutely no idea what's going on. It's been over a month now. <laughs> I was kind of scared. Okay, ASCII string to integer. This one is going to be um, for, let's do, okay, sum, int sum is equal to zero. We're going to do for, we're going to check each character in S. Not solving anything, just can't, just had an onside round and I will two tomorrow. Ooh. Wait, was this the Google onsite you were talking about? I can't remember when that was supposed to be. What company was the onsite for today? Goodness, two onsites though, back to back. That sounds rough. All right, tell me now. Now tell me your experience, because I'm really, really curious about um, kind of what maybe I'm not sure how much you can give away, but maybe just like general problem kind of spheres. You know, like was it DP graphs, trees? Just curious about your experience with the Google Onsite. Oh, what was he doing here? Right, um, messed up, I think, pretty badly. Oh man, what makes you say that? Was there one specific problem, or would you say, or was it... So if C is greater than or equal to... Only managed to solve one problem and no follows. Ooh, yeah, no. I think they always want you to solve two. Uh... Honestly, from what I remember from mine, I, I ended up not, so for the first problem, because I think there was uh, one behavioral and then four technicals, for the first behavioral, I saw, uh, for the behavioral, obviously not, it's behavioral, but for the first technical, I, I couldn't even solve the first problem. Second one, I, I, I did well on that one. Uh, third one, I did I did such a terrible solution for the third one like and I, I solved it but it was bad and I didn't even have the follow-up fourth one I 
did the problem, didn't get the follow-up, but I heard back. So, you know, there's always a there's always a chance that you hear back. Uh, sum plus equals C minus zero offset here. So you only got one problem each interview. I, I assume they might have had more, but... Yeah, so each of the interviews I assume was intended to be like a problem and then a follow-up. First one, I couldn't even solve the problem correctly. So I didn't get a follow-up there. Second one, I solved the problem and I think I solved the follow-up. Uh, third one, I solved the problem suboptimally. And then the fourth one, I think I solved the problem and I'm not even sure if there was a follow-up for that one. So that one I'm not entirely sure about. Um, let me turn some. I think I should really just be it for this problem. It might be just a compilation error. Really? Oh my goodness. Okay, I see what makes it more difficult. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I noticed that going, um, okay, fine. Okay, int uh, multiple. Okay, so we're gonna do multiple, it's gonna be equal to one. And then let's do int cur amount. Yeah, that's what makes this problem difficult. It's the fact that you can have tens. So basically my problem involved reading from a file and serialization to object. And for some reason I managed to do the most overcomplicated way possible. It took 20 minutes just to get there. Dude, I'm t it's, it's the nerves, you know, you could be the greatest fleet coder, but when you're standing, when you're in the interview with a company as big as Google, it's, it's just, you're so worried. I, I genuinely think that like, for me, I was kind of set on failing Google because I didn't think I was good enough. And I think going into it without actually, I guess expecting to do well, really helped me stay calm throughout all of it because I was just expecting to fail. But you get so nervous sometimes. Like my first Google interview for internships, I forgot arrays existed as a data structure. I think I've told the story before about how I've just, made a map with, that'll only ever hold one key and value, then I set up an iterator to iterate through the map to find the key to then get the value and mm, terrible. I guess now it's just waiting and seeing. You mentioned having two other onsites tomorrow, so at least you got your nerves out the way for this one. Um, let's do, so uh, cur, we're gonna do cur out. I'm going to expect, I'm going in expecting to fail now as well. I checked my smartwatch and I had an average pulse of 150 during my interviews. Yeah, see that, um, <laughs> that'll do it. It's, yeah, stress is a very big factor, I think, when it comes to interviewing. Like, um, we did mock interviews for our on-campus club and, you know, even those being mock interviews, I could tell kind of the person that I was interviewing was a tad bit nervous and, you know, and that's even in like a fake mock interview setting. I can't imagine kind of, my goodness, 150. Dude, that's like, that's my heart rate during like a pretty intensive workout. How stressed were you? <laughs> Turn them out. So we're going to do plus equals. We need to get the actual number here. Um, oh, wait a minute. No, I haven't. Yeah. By followers times. Oh, okay. Well, all right. How do I... Honestly, I don't know how to moderate chat from here, but I don't, I don't know how to delete that, so just let that stay there, I guess. <laughs> hey man, if they're gonna spam my chat, they could at least follow. <laughs> okay, so what we're gonna do, right, to shift this over by 10, we're gonna do per amount times 10 plus that. This is a trick that, oh man, I, learned it from one of the viewers actually in one of the questions regarding trees but what we're gonna do here is utilize this trick to just shift over the number by 10 and this avoids having to keep track of this multiple thing and then otherwise we're gonna do uh, sum plus equals cur amount and we're also going to from there just set cur amount equal to zero again And then I think down here we can just do sum plus equals cur amount again. This should handle it. So if you don't mind me asking, what um, what companies are your next two onsites for? And how far apart are these onsites? Because I remember uh, I think it was I had a Credit Karma final interview, 
with a interview for a company from North Carolina called Willow Tree. And it was my, I think it was the technical, just like the, um, the first technical. Had one interview round for, oh, oh, so it's not over. The on-site rounds are split. Yeah, because I remember I had, I had it for two separate companies and I had like, I think 15 minutes in between. So my entire morning was just filled with interviews for two separate companies. Man, so wait, so on-site, is it like in-person on-site or is there, are they still doing virtual on-sites? Because I'm, I'm think it's virtual, yeah. Because I'm thinking back to my Google ones, and they're they're exhausting. They are they are very exhausting to go through. Because I, funny enough, I, I don't know if I've mentioned that, but um, when I when I did the OA, I you know they told me, hey, you know, we'd like to bring you back for the on-site final, and I was like, yeah, cool. And the email they sent with my first scheduled like final day went straight to my spam box. I didn't even see it. So they called me like a month and a half later. They're like, hey, you know, um, you're supposed to be interviewing today. It's your third interview. Are you going to be there? I'm like, huh? So it turns out I, I had no idea I was supposed to be interviewing. I didn't confirm or anything. Um, so I missed my first like first onsite and I emailed them. I explained the situation. Like, Is there any way we can reschedule further? So they rescheduled me two weeks away. And at that point, I felt bad asking to split it. Um, so I just, I had all five rounds in one day. So my first round started at 10. It was like, what, 10 to 10.30 for the behavioral, then 11 to 11.45, uh, 12 to 12.45, 1 to 1.45, and 2 to 2.45. So back to back, um, one behavioral and then four Google on-site technicals. And I, I could not do it. And what's kind of funny is, uh, my lecture for my operating systems course started about 10 minutes, I think after I ended the interview. So I went straight from five rounds of Google onsite interviewing straight into lecture. And I, that was not a fun day, but I think it kind of paid off just to get it over with in one day. Okay, so given a string of parentheses S, return the minimum number of parentheses to remove to make the string balanced. Sounds awful. Yeah, it was, it was not a, not a fun time at all. Although, I mean, at that point, I didn't really even, I just, I guess like if I had been stressed, like, okay, I need to land Google. This is like what I want. This is what I want to do. This is where I want to be. I'd be a lot more worried and I think it'd make it a lot more difficult. But dude, their problems are brutal. Like from anything I've done, Google's on-site final has been at the absolute most difficult. It's up there in terms of difficulty with there was a company called Airtable that I did the off the OA for. It was, I think, four questions in one hour. And, no, not one hour, sorry. I think it was four questions, two hours. And it was a graph, a tree, a dynamic programming problem, and then I think a map question. And I, that, that, op, that OA is comparative, I think, to, to what Google gave me. But I mean, I, I solved the OA. I was asked to come back for the like on-site final, but I just I dropped it because I, I it was like somewhere in California, and that's not particularly a place I want to live in. So I didn't really bother going through with it. Okay, how do we determine how many parentheses we need to remove? I guess we literally just solve balanced parentheses, but this time, anytime it's not balanced, we just move on and we count it. So let's go ahead and do that. So. Um, let's do int open parentheses equals zero for car C in S dot two character array. We're going to split this up and we're going to check a couple things. So if, um, I guess if C is equal to a open parenthesis. Google's my number one choice for sure. I really want to make it in so I can help, so I can't help being stressed. I just hope that one video per round won't cost me the whole thing. Yeah, I guess one thing to remember always is at the end of the day, there are, you know, interviewers are people always also. So I feel like at least from what I've personally seen, a company would be more likely to hire someone who is, I guess like personable, like let's say 
there's two people, you know, one of them did slightly better on the OA, but, and, but it's just like a very difficult person to work with, but the other one did slightly worse on the, like, on the questions, but is, you know, just an overall better person to work with and would be a better fit for the environment, the environment, the, like, just like the work environment, the office environment. I feel like that person would be the one that'd be more, more likely to, in the end, get hired. So, yeah, keep, keep me updated. I'm really, really, you know, holding out for you. It'd be really nice if you ended up making it in, considering you mentioned kind of it's being your number one choice. Okay, else if open equals zero, remove plus plus. Otherwise, uh, we're gonna do open just minus minus. And let's keep track of a remove. Yeah, I guess for the next part, considering you saw like a serialization problem, I would probably expect like at least a graph and pro it's probably gonna end up being like one graph, one tree and like between graph tree and DP, I would say. If you get really lucky, you have a chance to probably see like a map based question. Please give me a graph or tree or link list. I love those. Yeah, it's oddly enough graphs. Once you figure out graphs, you realize there's like only two real graph problems and every graph problem is the exact same problem with like a slightly different condition you're checking for. Because yeah, no, dynamic programming is... The thing is, with trees, right, you have in order, post order, pre order. That's it for your trees. All you're doing is adding different conditions. For linked lists, you just traverse the thing and whatever, you know, you do some optimizations to the algorithm. Graphs, you have DFS, BFS, and as long as you know how to apply those to a... What's it called? Uh, adjacency matrix and adjacency list that's it that's like 99% of graph problems dynamic programming every single problem has a different reduction and it's so dumb because there's so many of them oh hey Thanos welcome back welcome back from your what 11 30 p.m. now Me man it's like nearly midnight okay so we're going to return remove Ah, I went the wrong way with the hour difference. My result was four. Okay. Uh, okay, why did it do Oh, right. We're gonna have to actually log the open parenthesis here. Uh, I'm not sure. A lot, some of these people are coming directly from kind of our university. Hmm. Oh, we're gonna do remove plus the remaining open parentheses. And I think that should handle it. There you go. So we're just gonna I think his nationality is Turkish. Huh. I think I think maybe, yeah. From what I know, probably. Largest island area. Oh boy, here we go. This is like number of islands, but slightly different. <laughs> Okay, you are given a two-dimensional integer matrix of ones and zeros. A one represents an uh, land, zero represents water. So an island is a group of ones that, whose neighboring perimeter is surrounded by water. Assume the edges are surrounded by water. Return the area of the largest island in the matrix. Two-dimensional problems are too easy. Yeah, it's... Oh man, this is gonna be just a... This is just a BFS on every time we find a one. Here, let's try... So... Let's do 4 int i equals 0, i is less than the matrix. You guys have a framework to know when parent problems need a stack or if a variable is just fine. I think the framework really is if your problem only has one type of parenthesis, for example, you know, if you only have something like this, then there's no need to keep a stack because you always know that if, if it's not a closed parenthesis, it's an open or vice versa. However, if you see problems that look like this, something like this, right? Where you have multiple types of brackets. I think in these cases, you are definitely going to need a stack because you not only need to check if it's an open parenthesis, you need to check for the type of open parenthesis as well. And because also when you have something like this, your order matters. So I think, yeah, because the order matters when you're looking at this, but this, there's no real order either because you just have open and closed. 
Okay, matrix.length. Cool. Uh, four int j equals zero. J is less than matrix zero dot length. All right. So what we're gonna do is check if matrix. Hey, Death Relics, welcome. All right, matrix at ij. We're gonna check if it's a one. And if it is, we're gonna do bfs. Uh, let's do a variable as well. Int max island size is zero. And then we're gonna do max island size. And the word island is, how do you get at least faster than 70% every single time? I think I just got lucky with these, because these problems, the algorithms aren't very complex. Most of the time I sit around like 50, 60. I've also been doing this long enough to just have a lot of very, very fast solutions. Not really memorized, but deep enough in my brain to where I can just pull at them when needed. So max island sized is equal to the maximum of itself and BFS my great unchecked palindrome Ruby I said <laughs> equals diversity with best <laughs> I mean <laughs> I mean that works. It's it's definitely a way to solve this palindrome. And it's still technically O of N, just like the optimized solution. Uh, let's do, okay, BFS of I, J, matrix. Okay, that should work. And here, down here, we can return max island size. Now we just need to write that BFS method. Public int BFS. Imagine an O of one solution. I think an O of one solution, there's, it would just have to be terribly inaccurate. Pull up the bits and memory using C. Interp, I don't, okay, honestly, I, I ain't got no idea what interpreter services are, but you would just have to, I think, purely guess if you wanted to, like you just 50-50 flip a coin and then say if it's a palindrome or not. Cause your coin flip takes the same amount of time each time. I actually don't use C-sharp. Man, I don't either. I will have to at some point, though. Hmm. My main language right now is C-sharp at work. That's kind of what I'm expecting if I end up joining Microsoft in the end. I'm expecting it to pretty much be in C-sharp. I've been doing side projects with Python to prepare for Google interviews. It's my interview. Really? Best case scenario, O of 1 speed, O of 1 memory. It's like BOGO sort being O of 1 in terms of everything when it works. Yeah. So, regarding Python, right, as an interview language, would you say, I guess, what was your primary language before Python, and would you say it was worth taking the time to relearn a new language for interviews? Because, I mean, it's, it's very understandable that, like, a verbose language like Java is not going to be the ideal one just because of how long it takes to write everything. But I'm just curious to see if it was worth it in your mind to C++. Okay. Because uh, C++ is very similar to C in terms of the fact that it's compiled, right? I think C++ is Yeah, it's actually one of the authored languages here. Um, it's like, for, it's like what, C? It's an entire other world. I tried to learn it, but... <laughs> Like, I want to have something easy and quick to read right. It was 100% worth it. Dude, C++, I, from my understanding, it's just C, but, like, it handles a lot more of, like, the memory management for you, right? And then it has, like, templates and stuff. 
I might be like entirely mistaken. Okay, um, int current count equals. Oh my goodness, no, no, why am I blanking? I shouldn't be blanking on this. Um, okay. So if i is greater than zero and i is less than matrix.length, because, um, I don't know, we've had a few people in our university switch to using Python as their main interview language, and some of the cheat sheets I've seen have been pretty nutty, but I mean, they, they always say it's worth it, but I feel like it's it's like a Python developer thing specifically. Like here, let me let me show you. This this is the only thing I can sort of envision. Uh, how do I how do I open this? This is the only thing I envision when I think about Python programmers and Python devs. <laughs> it's a pretty pretty adequate meme, I think, to describe it. You're right. C plus is just a superset of C. It's an object oriented programming language. I feel like going from C to C++, I think is easier than from pretty much anything else to C++. Okay, why is my, here, let me drag this coding, there you go, drag that a little bit so it actually fits. Getting close to the time, oh goodness, okay, I, I need to step up my game. Uh, and J is greater than zero, J is less than matrix at I. Dot link because here we've already verified that i is in range um so if if you run c on first compile uh yeah we get a few gigabytes of memory leak yeah, see, we had, um, let me see if I can find, I was working on the multi-threading assignment in C. Uh, where is it, where is it, where is it? Because we were, we finally got this assignment working, right? And afterwards, I opened, um, getting the hang of graph problems after a number of islands. Yeah, and then we I ran Valgrind because I needed to make sure it didn't have memory leaks and have issues. Um, I opened Valgrind, and this is what I was presented with. <laughs> 68 individual errors. And um, there was also, like, so many memory leaks. But after working in C for pretty much, nothing but C for pretty much, like, three or four days, <laughs> I got it to work. But I kid you not. You know what? Our, I, I I can I cannot describe my frustration because what ended up being the issue? Um, I'm assuming uh, so. Trial I'm assuming working with C plus plus. It's similar enough to see this part might make sense to you. But we were doing multi-threading, and in C you use the pthread API, right? So you can do pthread uh, underscore create, and then what you want to do is you want to pass in. Um, I think it's pthread creator start something like that. You pass in the id of like the thread pretty much and what, what we were doing is you're we doing this and we were doing like thread id right and then you pass in the method you wanted to run or the pointer to the method and then you pass in for example like we had an argument going in like which was just a void pointer right our program c usually it crashes if it does not compile correctly Choosing Python as my language programming choice, so let's go. It's it's so much simpler than anything else that I've seen pretty much. It's just learning the libraries and learning the data structures. But this, it, if C, if something doesn't work, you expect it to crash on compile and just not run. Ours ran. We're like, okay, cool. Uh, it worked. It ran the multi-threading thing. But once it exited both the threads, the program would just hang. We're like, okay, cool, you know, we're doing multi-threading, we're working with locks, maybe we're signaling incorrectly, maybe we have locks that we're using incorrectly somewhere. So we're like, all right, let's just, uh, you know, simplify things down. We pretty, we took out every bit of logic, so our thread consisted of creating, printing, and exiting. 
We're like, okay, okay, cool. You know, surely after this, it should just work. It runs through, it hangs. So we're trying to figure out what is going on. In the end, what ended up happening was that we were the one thing we were doing incorrectly. Let me let me copy the directly copy that line of code. Keep in mind, we spent three days and probably a collective of eight hours on this on this one portion. Uh, where is it? There it is. So this line right here. P thread join. Oh my goodness, we're getting all the all the spam bots today. <laughs> So this line right here, fairly simple, you know, P thread join, you pass in the thread and you pass in the value that it's going to return. Our only issue for this assignment that the reason it was hanging, but for some reason didn't crash was instead of passing in the actual thread, we were passing in the address of the thread. For some reason that compiles, it runs perfectly fine, but it hangs. You run GDB to debug it, shows both threads being created, both threads being exited, shows the main thread hanging. It works. You run it without the debugger, it crashes. It, it doesn't crash, it hangs. This, this one ampersand right here cost us, I kid you not, probably eight hours. And it was so frustrating when we, because we finished it and we got it and we finished the assignment within what, a couple hours after. Um, so what are we doing here? Um, we need to do, um, it's, it's so frustrating, like memory management and all of these super low level things. Mm. So, um, int curval equals, let's just do this, right? Fine. If matrix at IJ is equal to one, we're going to do, um, Curval equals what zero. Oh, why is this difficult? My brain is like refusing to remember how to solve these. Okay, curval equals one. I'm gonna do int left, int right, int up, and int down. And these are going to just do a BFS traversal for equals BFS of left is i minus one, j matrix and we're going to copy this very same logic to here but yeah now there's there's one more assign one more large scale assignment we need to do in c but i don't think anything is going to top this assignment because we were given what three weeks to do it and you know being the very intelligent individual that i am i started it a week before it was due with my partner isn't this more like a DFS though? Uh, I think this would be a BFS because we, let's say we start off here. I don't like how it works with the matrix. It's hard to tell. Actually, you make a fair point. It might be. Technically, it could be seen as a BFS or as a DFS rather. If it... Um, one and plus one how would you even do a bfs you'd need like a dis you need to distinctly use a queue i think to do a, a bfs on a matrix j plus one traversal order doesn't matter so long as all i would be so visited yeah what keyboard are you using? Um, yeah, I can actually just link the keyboard directly. We pull up, pull out this uh, link here. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I. Wait, why is this? I can't wrap my head around. Uh, let me see. Is it this one? No, no, no. It's not this one. Um, I think I've shown my keyboard before, but it is. One of these, you send a link in. I went ahead and got it with the, I got it with the red switches and the aluminum bezel, just because the aluminum bezel makes it feel a lot 
kind of more premium and a lot heavier. I took them off to like do some modding. Oh, right, it is great in the Eclipse Zero, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and it felt super light with just the plastic. Because, yeah, it is... Hold on. I can't, I can't even drag it far enough out. There we go. A little bit hard to see with the lighting, but I bought like a $20 Amazon keycap set. Uh, yeah, it's great. Just the $20 keycap set. It's quite nice. I have a sticker on there from don't even remember where. But yeah, it's I paid around maybe close to $100 for my configuration. But honestly, it would I would I'd say it's worth it. I really like it. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, I I did do a little bit to it. I I took some what was it like some grease? I can't remember what it was, and I put it on the stabilizers because they are a bit rattly. And I put foam inside of it, and I've also got it on a mouse pad. So yeah, here I can can do a little. Because I, I like the red linear switches. The first one I got, I got with browns, but I returned it just because tactile switches really were not for me. I like click it more than mechanical. I'm quick on the chick. Oh, the chick lift. Uh, I, you know, it's to each their own. I used to be very, very quick on typing on those. I actually have, hold on. Let me see if I can pull it out real quick. Yeah, there it is. My first kind of original keyboard that I bought, the Microsoft Sculpt. You can see where my palms rest from the wear and tear on this thing. But this thing served me really well. And if you're looking for kind of an ergonomic keyboard, I would highly recommend it. It was like 50 bucks when, it, when I got it. It was on sale, but it was well worth the money. I used it for many years it's very quiet very satisfying to type on but to be completely honest once i went to mechanical i don't think i could ever go back and my typing speed took a bit to get up to speed going from ergonomical but yeah it's a great collection thank you yeah i don't really use that one anymore it's like my secondary keyboard for like raspberry pis and whatnot okay let's actually go ahead and solve this question but my typing speed after a while, I got up to, I think, 110 on mechanical. 110 words per minute. Um, and if it's that, we're going to return uh, curval plus left plus right plus up plus down, I think. And otherwise, we're going to return... I think otherwise we can just return zero. This won't work at all, I think. Oh, I forgot it. Amp. There you go. Let's go ahead and split these conditions up into multiple lines. Um, still doesn't compile. BFD. BFD, BFD, BFS. Gotta, let's get this nasty C code out of here. We don't need this in our life. Cool. Um, oh, this is gonna infinitely hang. Yeah, it's okay. TLE. Um, J. Matrix. Oh, I forgot to actually update the matrix. I J equals zero. Uh, I can do this very quickly. Oh, what? I was not expecting that to work. I don't really understand why that works, but I guess it works. <laughs> I mean, yeah, this lo this part right here, I was expecting it to just end up returning zeros. But I guess because our initial call is made on a one, that works. Sure, I'll take it. It's got the silver medal and everything. I just didn't expect the logic. Hope I get a good flood fill problem tomorrow. Yeah, dude, flood fill. Yeah, flood fill is nice. It is. Once you get the logic down, I think for one flood fill problem, I think you can get it for most. Yeah, one, oh, okay, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that the link I sent in on Amazon was, like, the official Keychron page, because buying, it's very easy to buy, like, random nonsense keyboards on Amazon, but 
I just wanted to make sure if I did share anything it'd be the correct one. One thing to note about this keyboard though, it is a, what? It's smaller than a TKL, but you get to keep your arrow keys. However, you will also have like three row. I think you have, um, here, let's, let me, let me pull this link aside here. If you look at it, right? Ooh, that's not what I wanted at all. Uh, how do I, how do I get this to here? Let's, uh, let me look up the actual, okay. Keychron K6. Hey man, it's good to see ya. Uh, there we go. Let's open up this image here. One thing to note about the keyboard is it might not be the greatest thing for programming because if you, so you have the option key right over here. And then you have one function key as well as a second function key. You have two separate rows of macros. And the macros are relatively easy to keep track of. Only 65 and 70% keyboards exist for me. No, don't, like, I love this form factor. I love the size. I love everything about it. But to type a backtick, right, in JS, um, in, in JS for, back, for like formatted strings of backticks, you, um, you kind of need backticks. To do that, you need to press, I think, this function key and then that. To do a tilde, you need this function key and that. To access your like modifiers for like sound, brightness, and everything else, it's one function key in the number row and then that. You see, this is fine, right? They have it all really well marked out. But can you see the issue with me remembering where the macros are on this keyboard? <laughs> Swapping the keycaps, I now have absolutely no idea what is where. So do remember that if you swap out keycaps, it may look super pretty, but you won't be able to find any of your macros. There's a macro somewhere on here to switch between Bluetooth devices. I have no clue where that is. I, I've had to look up, like reference this image so many times. But there is one that I was considering. Uh, I was considering going up to a TKL just because it's it's bigger it keeps the function row check the eight points does it look better uh which one is that if you want to drop a link to it i'll check it out but yeah look at look at how look how pretty this one looks it's same company i've only ever really bought like keychron boards just because i've only ever bought again one but look how nice this looks it looks so pretty yeah as i think the k8 is if i'm not mistaken it's going to be the same thing but with the function row yeah it's i think this was initially the the one that i bought yeah oh wait no this isn't the one that i bought i think i bought another one earlier that had the function row on top but i don't know i felt like i was i was losing out on like the pretty aspect of it by having the ugly function row and I was like man if I'm gonna get a function row I might as well get like a form factor that I like but this one is there no like side profile view of the board because it looks like it kind of looks like the keys are like very very thin hold on Keychron K8 I just want to see a side profile picture another thing to know about the Keychron boards is they are very very tall for me, I have a wrist rest that I use because without it, the angle of your wrist sits like this to type on it, and it's very uncomfortable. So just also note that you will have to most likely get a wrist rest. Yeah, see, the thing with the key, with the K8, let's even look at this picture. I just don't like how the keys sit on this one. Look how high up, like, they are off the board, and they're still, like, spaced out. I think that'd be the one thing that would turn me away from getting this board. Uh, let's see, the Primium Dactyl. Let's see what this one is. Oh goodness, what is this? What did you just say? <laughs> this is, um, does it connect through a headphone jack? What? I've seen the other K- I'm assuming this is meant to be Ergo, right? This has to be like Ergo. Four hundred and seventy-five bucks, though. Oh, you can choose your twenty-one LEDs per side. Don't use this one outside. Oh no! I'm... 
I think I already know ex if you're gonna link me a board, I think I know exactly which one it is. <laughs> but yeah, I was I was really debating getting a Q1. Like it's it's still it's still kind of on my mind as a board to potentially get. Cause I mean it's not particularly expensive. Like the Q uh, the Q1 I think is like hundred and eighty dollars, maybe? Oh, it's a hundred and I think hundred and fifty for the um uh, oh it's on sale now as well, yeah. It is 180 off sale, fully assembled, bare bones, 150. The nice thing about it is that it's hot swap. Like I kind of wish my board, I wish I paid a little bit more for the hot swap version, just because I was debating like shelling out some money for some like loop yellow switches. Cause from what I, you know, looking at sound tests and everything. Oh no, what is, what is this? Is this one of those mice that, Oh, the, oh no, not the advantage. I this one it's so expensive and it's so like cheap. This is not available in India. That's the problem. Mm, yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah, I'm not even. Yeah, I honestly I would have gone for like this navy blue one. Though I think this board it if you mod it enough it's just really nice. But from the start it just has a very strong ping to it. Oh, but look how nice it looks. Hmm. I just can't justify spending $180 on a keyboard until this one dies, but, you know, good on Keychron for making- this thing's lasted me oh, like a year now, and I don't think it's going down anytime soon, so it looks like the, the Q1 might be, I guess, out, <laughs> out, of my, uh, out of my purchase for a while. Are we done in this room yet? Okay. Still nothing from Google. Uh, about a week and a half, maybe a week ago now, they told me they were still no updates regarding whether they wanted to continue with me or not. Um, but, I don't know. It's been, my final interview with them was, let's see, it was on January, I think 18th I had Google on January, like 18th, that week. So that's one week, two week, three week, four week, five week. About six weeks now. They've seen your Twitch channel, that's why. Uh, can't justify buying a, this one to listen to Dizor unless you get to Fang. I mean, I've got a standing offer from Microsoft, which I think is about as close to Fang as I'd want to be. I get the status of a Fang company and the salary of close to pretty much what most Fang companies will offer you, maybe a little bit less, without having to be worried about like constantly getting booted off. Hey, who's on dev? Hello, welcome. You had five interviews in one day, right? Yep. That was all five for Google, all five of their interviews. Microsoft shouldn't, it, it should. I don't know, I honestly, I was surprised Microsoft is not like labeled as Fang. It's so weird for me, I only get to do the last two if I get good enough feedback from the first three? Yeah, that's weird. I guess because I scheduled them all in one day, they didn't have the option to do that. They didn't have the option to not interview me. My titles are gonna get progressively like more condescending and more passive aggressive towards how long it's taking Google to reply. I kid you not, like at this point, with how they've handled hiring, I don't even know if I'd like, I guess I'd definitely consider accepting them, but what I really want to do is, I've mentioned it before and I'm sure the people that have been here long enough would remember, but um, sometime in 2021 I was driving through the Seattle area and I, I got a little lost because Seattle's confusing with all their streets. And I ended up going through like the Google office district and I sort of like made an internal promise to myself that like next year I would have a, an offer kind of here at this company. And that was one of the things that kept me motivated to continue to like, you know, look for internships even when it seemed like all the internships were closed and I still found one to continue interviewing, try for the internship, fail for the internship, but keep grinding. And if I can actually get like a physical paper offer from Google, I'm printing it, I'm framing it, I'm buying like a nice not Dollar Tree frame and I'm putting it right there on that wall. It's going to be hanging there and it's going to be hanging there when I move out. Because I said I was going to do it and I did it, so... It's going to be a little bit sad if I don't, but I'll just print out the email that says I passed the final interview <laughs> and call it good. Uh, okay, so N Rooks, let's look at time and space complexity for this, right? Um, if there was a built-in factorial function, if there was a way to do factorials in O of 1, it would be O of 1. Because people need to know a legend was living here. 
I'll do the thing where people like cut it out, cut out like a, a hole in their wall and put something inside. So when the next person demolishes like the house or they're doing renovations, they find it. Except it's just gonna be like an offer letter of acceptance from Google. So for this one, we are going to say O of N time with O of one space because we're only using variables. And I think I can actually, um, I'll, I'll see if I can get to the end with like the M the Rooks problem to explain sort of why it is the way it works the way that it works. Um, I, I remember vaguely like the explanation. It was pretty interesting the first time I saw it. So ASCII to string, all we're doing here is pretty much checking is it a number or is it anything else? If it's anything else, we want to, let's start here. So if it's a number, one, the, initially I thought that I just needed to sum up the digits, but I actually need to sum up the numbers, which is quite different. So this little trick right here, man, this trick from, I think it was uh, Max Flow, the username mentioned it. Um, this trick has helped me out a lot when it comes to this, because if we multiply the number by 10, essentially what we're doing is shifting it left by one and leaving a zero at the end. So while doing that, we can then sum up this current number to get the correct num numerical representation. So for example, we have 32. First time around we come, we see it's a number, we do zero times 10 is zero plus three. Next time we come around, we find the two, we see it's a number. We do three times 10, which is 30, and then we add on the two and we get 32. Coming forward, we find the B, we figure out that's not a number, we add 32 to our current sum and we replace current amount back to zero. And by doing the same step every time, we end up with the solution to the problem and I think it was a fairly fast solution at that. Yeah, 98.63%. Uh, time and space wise, I believe this would be a solution that runs in again O of N time as well as O of one space. Simple as that. What's the acceptance rate? 91%. We're slowly starting to get out of like the 98, 95 percentile for the acceptance. It's slowly starting to go down to the more complex, worse problems. This problem, it was quite interesting because it was one thing where, um, you know, in an interview you could solve it O of N time with O of N space. Where if you use the stack like you would for all, for like the generic balance parentheses questions, um, you could, you know, solve it like this. But I think as an interviewer, the next follow up question would be to say, you know, can you optimize this to not use space? And I think it was the Ching that asked earlier um, you know, why, how do you know when you need to use um, a stack versus not needing to use a stack? And I think a very important insight to take from this is that if you have only one type of parenthesis in your um, string, if there's only ever one type of parenthesis, you know, be it a regular parenthesis, be it a square bracket or a curly bracket, if there's only ever one type, you don't ever need to check for it to be anything else. Because you know if it's not a closed parenthesis, it's an open parenthesis. But when you have different types, to see if it's matching, you find a closed one. Not only do you need to check, hey, is there an open one, but is the open one of the correct type to match with me? So that's why here we can just use a counter to keep track of open parentheses. And replacing the stack for this counter, we are able to bring it down from O of N space to O of 1 space. And what we do is every time we find an open parenthesis, we add one to our open counter. Then every time we find a closed one, there's a couple things to check. Hey, do I have a open parenthesis that I can match with? If I can, I just remove that open parenthesis from the quote unquote stack. However, this is the very important insight here. If there's no remaining open parentheses for us to match to and we find a closed one, we know that this one makes this an invalid parenthesis. And while in other, um, you know, if, if we're just checking to see balanced parentheses, here we would return, we would just return false. But because we just need to see how many we'd need to remove, we just find, hey, this one makes it invalid, let's remove it. So on the return, we return the amount that we had to remove along with the remaining number of open parentheses, because for it to be balanced, every open has to have a close. 
And if there's any open remaining, that means those also make it unbalanced. So we go ahead and remove those as well. We could reasonably just down here say um, remove plus equals open to say uh, remove the remaining open parentheses. And then here we can just return that. That might make it a bit easier to understand, but overall pretty good problem. Uh, in one of these interviews, instead of removing a parentheses, I got asked to add brackets instead and make the string a matching type. Like that can be the answer can be that. Yeah, so that is a, a bit more challenging, I think, but you just have to do like every time you find a open one without a closing one, you just have to add it and then yeah, I definitely that would definitely be an interesting one to try at some point. It definitely does. It's a lot more challenging than this one for sure. And largest island area. This one, I think this one goes up there in terms of the ones I'd recommend to try if you're trying to learn and get into graph problems. Number of islands and now largest island area, I think would be the two that I would recommend. I would highly recommend if you don't really understand how graph problems work because they number of islands was my first graph problem and once I solved that one, it sort of spiraled from there. So I would highly, highly recommend it. What we're doing here is we're just checking to see when we find a one, which is an island, we want to just, um, so find the size of the island. And that's really, that's really it for this logic. Once we find this, we wanna find the size of the island and just keep track of whatever the maximum size is. This BFS method down here is really the one that's doing all the heavy lifting for us in this question. Uh, the first check we're doing is to see, is the coordinate in bounds? If it's not in bounds, you know, if, we're, if we would get an index out of bounds exception, we just return zero because there's nothing to find here. There's no island that can be started here. However, if it is, what we want to do, uh, can you just do this for example down here I can condense this a lot but I want to leave it this way right now for readability so what we're checking is to say hey is the current block we're looking at an island if it is an island what we do is we know that hey at this stage this is part of an island so we want to make sure we count that as a one and then the very important thing is this line right here. Mark as visited. If you notice the first time that I ran it, I could even comment out this line as a whole. This will not work. It'll infinitely go back and forth. And I think we will, yeah, stack, oh, hey, look, it's a stack overflow error. So the reason we need this line so much is because it marks that spot on the graph as visited. Because if you think about having a matrix, where let's say we have a two by two matrix. We have a one, one, and then we have one, and we have one. And let's say we started, we found this one. From here, our curve value is equal to one, and we traverse left, right, up, and down. Let's take a look at the right traversal. So from this one, we're going to traverse right by one. And being here, we're like, hey, look, it's also a one, so we can add one. But the right traversal then goes and traverses back left. Now having this line, not having this line, we traverse left, we check, hey, left is a one as well, we traverse to the right again, and we keep going back and forth indefinitely. But having this line, once we find this one, we replace it with a zero. That way, when we traverse right and inevitably make the call back to left, we find that it's a zero and we're done from there. So this is what allows us to not run indefinitely. So the reason that this works is we check left, right, up, and down from every spot. So let's make this, for example, a three by three array. There we go. Cool. If we make it a three by three array and somehow by some pure miracle, let's say we start here. We find this one, we then traverse up. We traverse left, rather. We find this one, we add it to our count, we replace it with a zero. Then we check left again, that's out of bounds. From left, we go right. This one's already a zero. Then we go up. This becomes a one. So yeah, I don't remember who mentioned this being a DFS, but I, I think this acts more like a DFS than it does a BFS. So yeah, we go there and we continue this until we have all zeros. 
And then, recursively, we pass up the sum, and that sum ends up being the sum of this individual island. And going back up to the matrix, keep in mind, because depending on your language, if it's passed by reference or passed by value, Java passes arrays as parameters and arguments as references. So here, we're not passing the state of matrix, we're not passing, we're not making a new version of matrix locally in our method, we are passing a reference to where matrix is stored. So after coming back from the BFS, let's say this ended up being, let's say our island, let's say our map looked like this. We find this one, we replace this with zero, and we replace this with zero. Having done that, this is now what our loop is iterating through. So now our loop will keep going, it'll keep going until it finds this one. And it'll call the BFS on this one as well and perform the same operations that we were discussing earlier. So I think time complexity wise, the absolute worst thing we can see is probably some sort of N. I may be mistaken, and if, if uh, there's a better explanation here, I'd love to hear it, but my best guess for this one would be O of n time with O of 1 space. And the reason I'm saying it would be O of 1 space is because we're not really utilizing anything besides constant variables, and the reasoning behind O of 1 time has to be, or rather O of n time, is that we traverse tech... We tra we I'm trying to think of the worst case here. I think our worst case really would be if we had something like this. Actually, L of n times m, yeah. That, that's what I guess that would be. I was trying to think of the worst L of n is incorrect here because they defined n as the number of rows. Oh, right, I didn't even notice this. Yeah, it'd be n times m. That's a very good catch, thank you. So, but I, I guess I'm thinking about the worst case where Let's say we have all ones, right? What we would be doing is traversing from here, we'd find this one, we'd go through and replace everything else with zeros, so we've checked every element once, and then we would, our for loop would traverse again, so I think technically it's like n plus m plus n times m. Like, as an absolute worst case scenario. Um, yeah, here, I'll be back in a second. I do want to take a closer look at this problem, though. It, the time complexity is quite interesting here. Okay, so I think the thing to note here as well is even though it might be n times m plus n times m as the kind of worst, this would just simplify to n times m. I think for graph problems as well, if you're going to be doing these, it would... I think the more correct term, even if you're working with graph problems, would be what? V times E? Uh, where it's like vertices and edges. Never really understood, like, it was kind of confusing with the naming, but... Okay, so... Yeah, that's very, very interesting set of questions. I, I like the fact that this one showed up so I could discuss kind of how the solution worked for it. Uh, if there's any sort of last minute closing questions anyone has regarding interviews, any... I don't know, my advice, I'd still take it with a grain of salt because, you know, I haven't really started working, haven't done any professional interviews myself, but I've done enough of them to where I think maybe might be slightly qualified to give at least some sort of help. So yeah, if there's any questions, you can feel free to ask away. Hmm. I keep looking back at this keyboard. I need, I need to stop looking at this before I go and impulse buy it. 
Pretty it's just very, very pingy though. And the keycaps aren't as high quality as maybe you'd like. Maybe, oh goodness, they're only available. Can you run me through quickly over your Google rounds again? How many problems each round? How many did you answer? Can you code the solution in Python? <laughs> Go away. I can't code in Python and you know it. You know what? No, no. This, this is you. Th this is you right here. That's you. Um, so, Google rounds. Um, first, so first round was behavioral. I'm just gonna skip over that because behavioral just isn't particularly interesting. Uh, my first round was a graph problem with an interviewer who was pretty much just kind of absent, like on Slack, mess sending messages the whole time. So it was a fairly challenging graph traversal problem. I, I honestly, I would say solved it, but in air quotes, like a hard air quotes, because my solution kind of sucked, like, like really, really bad. <laughs> so second problem was a tree problem. I pretty much aced the problem and I guess you could call it the follow-up. It was like a, okay, now given the method that you wrote, use that method to write this. So I assume that's the follow-up. I aced that problem like entirely. There was like one small mistake, but I ended up fixing it. And the interviewer in the end said like, hey, you know, this is great. This is like exactly what I was looking for. There was one mistake, but you found it. So I don't really have anything else to say. Third problem, I, it was like, I once again solved it in air quotes. It was pretty much like you were given a infinite like buffer input of floating point numbers and you had to do like some computation with them. Uh, that one, there might have been a follow up, but I didn't even get to the follow up. I just gave a super crummy unoptimized solution. And at the end of that, I did propose a faster solution and it ended up utilizing um, kind of like a BST almost like for it to find values and whatnot but so yeah that one solved ish in air quotes plus proposed a optimized solution at the end and the fourth one it was fairly easy because i think they realized i was just brain dead at the end of the day uh that problem was more focused on um it was more so focused on good code design, like error handling, throwing errors, catching, you know, using throw, try catch blocks where they're needed, uh, checking to make sure that there were no sort of, I guess, exploits where like you wouldn't have any infinite recursive scenarios that you'd run into. But I think I did pretty well on that. I solved the first part of it and I mostly solved the follow up. So I think that would be about a pretty good description of how that part went as a whole. So yeah, I think Maybe we're thinking and it's fine <laughs> that I only solved one problem then. I always read people getting two problems each round, but it seems like you got one and some follow-ups to it. Yeah, I there was never a point where I got um, two distinct problems. It was always, it was always one and a follow-up. But yeah, just don't, you know, don't stress out about it too much because the more you stress out about it, the more difficult it's gonna become got two mediums once for my phone screen so I expected that for a ways anyone know if the code is read or what matters if it just passes all test cases mm. so I guess my only example of that would be to so for a company called Twilio there I got their OA solved one question easily it was like a number parsing thing second question I was running out of time so I hard coded a solution to like three of the cases into my problem and I passed all test cases and to this day they still email me about about like hey you're you're still under consideration still under consideration I don't know if that means because I mean I didn't get interviewed for the final but I'm under consideration so I I think maybe if it's like a phone screen then maybe they will read it but um But yeah, I think it's not entirely like red. Uh, let me see if I can actually hold on. Yeah. Uh, hold on. Let's see. Let's see if I can actually open this somehow to to show it. 
Hmm. How do I how do I get it from here? Yep. <laughs> got two layers away. Well, like got their ahoy. I'm trying to show just the sheer amount of ahoy emails that I received. Because it is it is a little bit absurd the sheer amount of ahoy they sent. See where was my MS Paint? Okay, let's just go ahead and add a paint window here. Let's do media. That's not what I wanted. I want a window capture. Okay, where did my window capture go? Okay, well, can't unsub from the, wait, you actually, did you also get the same? Let me know if you got any questions to email from your Google recruiter. I get it like three or four times a week and almost feel bad for not answering. Bro, I, you at least get emails. I get nothing. <laughs> like, I, I actually get nothing from them. Like, I had to send an email to know if I was even, like, still under consideration, and it took him two days to get back to me. So, I, I get, like, nothing. Let's see. Um, paint. So, let's see, where is it? There we go, hold on, let me, let me go ahead and draw over some things here. Yeah, well, here I don't have much competition as far as I know trying to join office in Hungary so they have time for me they're, you're like their one applicant and they just keep yeah okay so if you look at this right this this has been what I've been receiving from Twilio for the past couple months every single time it's just ahoy so I think going back to the actual question that was asked here um, it's they I doubt they read it unless it's like a startup To be completely honest, I didn't really care about Twilio once I... I just kind of gave up on them. But I mean, if we go to levels that FYI, they do have a pretty decent, like... Let's see. Uh, 115k... Oh, wait a minute. Maybe I should have cared. <laughs> yeah, so their base is higher than I think what even Microsoft is offering me. But again, uh... 24k in stock a year kind of mediocre and it's definitely a really solid company but here let's look at the lc entry level a majority of them are at 150k compensation but yeah that's that so yeah definitely keep me posted on the google process i'm really really rooting for you really excited hoping that you actually do make it in because it seems like Seems like you, you know, you probably have a good shot considering they're seeing if you have any questions four times a day. Let's see. What, what other... I'm kind of curious on... Man, I, I wonder what's going to happen. I hope I can go... Get the little, I hope I can go to the last two rounds. I'm sure you got this. Just don't... Don't be too stressed to ace the next two rounds. Watch. I'm, I'm calling it. I'm calling it. You're going to get a flood fill problem tomorrow. And... Let's, let's say, like, a medium difficulty tree problem. Have you applied for FE or SDE roles? So, FE is... What does FE stand for? I know SDE, but I don't recognize the, the FE abbreviation. Some diverse answers before. What, what does FE stand for? Oh, front end. Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> I, if you couldn't, uh, man, if you'd ever see any of my projects that I worked on by myself, you would realize that um, front end really, like, really, really is not my thing. <laughs> like, even for example, um, even for example, right, our game. Oh, boy. Um, here, let me, for our, oh, it's going to be so loud. Please don't be, please don't be loud. Okay. So if you look at our game, right, it looks fine. Until you realize, like, you scroll... 
you scroll down and like, yeah, front end really is not my thing. <laughs> So I'm trying mostly for SDE. It, the only time I do would be willing to do front end if I was full stack. Because for Microsoft, I was offered to join the um, OneDrive SharePoint team. So I'm hoping I don't get stuck just doing like React development for the front end of that. Applying for generic software engineer with a side of ML. I think that's what I applied to as well. I want to get away from the front end as far as possible. What do you mean? You don't like writing CSS and trying to center divs? Okay, I, I think that'll be it for, for me today. I've got to go work on this project. I've had to neglect it because of this multi-threading assignment, but... Hmm. People still somehow manage to find what other skills did they assess apart from algorithms and data structures. If we're talking about sort of, um, obviously algorithms, data structures, the cleanliness of your code, I think is a very big one. What, what did you say my questions will be? Yeah, so I, I, call, I call dibs on a flood fill and like a medium difficulty tree problem. So we'll see. But yeah, other than algorithms and data structures, I think honestly soft skills, like how well you can communicate your, I think, yeah, communication probably. One line, I keep mentioning it, but it's it's one that's gotten me through pretty much every behavioral by just repeating it in different variations, is to try to be understanding before being understood. And if you emphasize, like, every, legit, every one of my answers is just like, I'd want to see what they have to say, understand them, and then try and explain to them, rather than just like, I'll explain and then I'll listen. And that one's gotten me through so much. But I think probably just your communication abilities because when you're working on a team those are very important as well as um i think one thing maybe i've noticed is how you react to sort of difficult situations for example if you're working on a problem and all of a sudden everything goes wrong or like you know they drop a problem that's really difficult do you immediately give up and just say oh i don't know how to do this you know let's move on or do you still take the time to even if it is on a surface level, understand it to write out your solution to the best of your ability. And I think that's another important quality I would try. Quimkoff, hey, first time chat from viewer, welcome. I've applied to meta internship. I'm practicing on LeetCode and binary search. Any tips? Ooh, meta is one that I got, re I got rejected at a resume screen. So I, uh, I think again, just keep practicing. Um, depending on when your time is, if you have, you know, months before your internship, um, I would just do like, you know, make sure I know pretty much everything, but otherwise, you know, I, by everything, I, I mean like, make sure I'm comfortable with all of the major ones like graphs, trees, um, stacks, queues, whatever else it is. However, if you don't have that time, yeah, blind 75, there you go. I was going to say, if you don't have that time, I would go to either Blind75 or, let me pull this aside, um, I'm sure you can look up for leak code specifically, you can, I've never seen that, yeah, that's great, thank you. Yeah, you can also go on leak code and specifically select for um, meta problems, so down here, I'd probably recommend just, oh, they're still labeled as Facebook. Okay, just do that. And then sort by most common in the last however long. And that should give you a pretty good understanding of, there you go, yeah. Wait a minute, is this the problem that we just did? Hold on. Yeah, minimum remove to make valid parentheses. Hold on. <laughs> Let's go. Cool. We just, um, I guess that that's one, one more tip for you. Now you have a video recorded solution of apparently the most frequent face Facebook problem in the past six months. <laughs> but yeah, uh, trial, you had that one last question. I'll go ahead and answer that and then probably head out for the day. Yeah, for sure. Happy to help. Do you have a set date or are you just kind of waiting to see if they'll bring you on for an OA? Because yeah, blind, if you are if you don't really have 
too much time blind 75 plus just these top tagged questions i've heard works really well for people for people but if you are you know just beginning as a whole i would definitely spend maybe a week uh just doing the general sort of easy binary search questions to probably easies and mediums to get the hang of things and then move on to those questions how many hints did you get usually for rounds? I got two to three where I had to make small adjustments and fix typos. I was all over the place. Yeah, I, I've done that a fair bit. I think, um, I'm assuming they use the same sort of document where it's just syntax highlighting with no, doesn't complete your lines, doesn't fill in your brackets, doesn't highlight anything. It just colors things based on your syntax. Um, I think, I think that should be fine, honestly. Like, what you do, literally what I was like, then there's like, oh, you know, and I think you're missing like a parenthesis here or, you know, you didn't capitalize. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, oh, oh, thank you. Like, you know, I didn't notice that it's hard when, you know, it doesn't like it doesn't fill it in. And you just kind of laugh along with them, just kind of keep the conversation going. And I think that's 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 more than fine. If it's more of like, a, oh, hey, um, maybe we should not do this and try doing it this way. I think that might be where you run into a bit of trouble. Currently waiting for my first contact. I only received an email about my referral and they'll reach within the reach out to me within the first 14, 14 days. Yeah, I'm hoping to hear back from them. Meta is a great company from what I heard. It's like the nice balance of really high pay as like a full-time with the work balance that people are looking for. It's kind of like Amazon, but better for work balance. And you don't have to worry about getting fired every day. All right, but I'm not, Sure, you know, uh, once I hear back from Google and kind of get a final update, I'll probably go ahead and start then, stop streaming then, but for now I'm going to keep going, so I hope to be around to hear good news about that. Salary negotiators, people often advise to get competitive offers, let's say A pays 130, B pays 120. How does companies offer B? Um, I think what you can say there, I, again, take this with a big grain of salt, my negotiation is not the greatest. The only reason I was able to negotiate at Microsoft was doing kind of some research and B having a higher competing offer, which also helped a lot. But from uh, I was also getting a lot of help from other university students who'd done it before. I would say that um, you know you can say company you are more excited to join company B and you're considering it. You can say they provide you with a better work. You know, like just kind of on the spot here, like, you know, better, let's say, work-life balance. They provide you with more PTO, more flexible PTO. They provide better medical benefits. They can provide you with, um, I don't know, better equipment, or it's like a dream company. Even if it isn't your dream company, it might as well become for the situation. But I think if you can say, like, it's like, oh, you know, they provide me with, you know, let's say better, better PTO, better medical benefits. They also have a higher growth, because keep in mind, you don't need to actually give the name of the company when i was negotiating with microsoft for example i didn't provide them the name of the company that i got an offer from i just provided them with the details the location so i think if you can make a convincing enough argument that your growth at that company will be a more impactful for you it'll be better career growth and you'll grow to make more there as well as having let's say better pto better work balance and everything and then you can say however if you can you know raise my compensation 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 geez, to you know XYZ with like stock and whatever then it would make up for that difference in whatever else and I'd be more compelled I would be a junior company that'd be my best guess at that but again do the research find people who are more qualified to talk about it that's just my best guess at it I'm gonna head out for the day it's almost midday and I haven't had my breakfast yet so I hope that you know there were some good takeaways from the session I hope that people learned something and I hope to be back tomorrow if I can get all the work I need to get done before then done but yeah thank you everyone for stopping by I'm hoping to hear good news regarding that Google interview hopefully from cough you get you get that actual contact from meta hopefully get to what is it meta mates they call them i'm not even sure yeah thanks you for all the info i'll keep you updated yeah for sure i'm i'm you know keeping my fingers crossed for you
All right. Thank you ever for stopping by and I'll see you all tomorrow.